This channel is part of the History Hit Network. In the 8th century, Charlemagne seized power over the entire Frankish kingdom. He went to northern Italy, conquered Pavia, and had himself crowned King of the Lombards there. The only thing Charlemagne had to worry about were the sons of his deceased brother, who could have made a claim for the throne. Charlemagne had them abducted from their mother's hands. At the same time, to the east of the kingdom, the Saxons were fighting the Franks. At first, Charlemagne managed to win important battles, but then the rebel leader, Widukind, grew into an enemy who resisted bitterly. Bei allen Göttern schwöre ich, Widukind. Das räche ich. Deine Untertanen, deine Krieger, selbst deine Fürsten, sie alle sind des Krieges müde und mit Verlaub. Ich bin es auch. Against all advice, Charlemagne rushed to help the governor of Saragossa. He was hoping to expand his kingdom all the way to Spain. But the plan went wrong. The city gates remained closed and Charlemagne had to retreat. At the same time, the Saxons exploited the absence of the Frankish army and rebelled once again under their leader, Widukind. Now Charlemagne was prepared to do whatever it took. He ruthlessly forced the Saxons into submission and had thousands of rebels beheaded. But their leader, Widukind, kept escaping capture. Willst du dein Leben retten? Dann sag mir, wo ist euer Anführer? Wo ist Widukind? Ah! Widukind became Charlemagne's nightmare. Everything depended on whether he succeeded in capturing the rebel leader, thereby breaking the Saxon resistance for good. Charlemagne's mother, Bertrada, and his wife, Hildegard, died in the same year. Charlemagne ruled out his son from his first marriage, Pepin the Hunchback, as heir to the throne, in favor of Hildegard's sons. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. 
Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. Charlemagne was definitely someone who we can't relate to. That's because of his personal attitude to life and the juxtaposition of the very brutal actions he performed as a ruler and the great personal charm and charisma which he undoubtedly must have possessed. Karl was of high Seine Augen waren sehr groß und lebhaft. Die Nase etwas lang. Auch war sein Nacken zwar etwas dick und kurz. Und sein Bauch trat ein wenig hervor. Noch fielen diese Fehler bei dem Ebenmaß seiner Glieder nicht sehr auf. Seine täglichen Mahlzeiten bestanden aus vier Gängen. Und Fleisch hasse er lieber als alles andere. Ärzte hasste er, weil sie ihm vorschrieben, dass er das Bratenfleisch aufgeben und dafür gekochtes Fleisch essen sollte. Er beklagte sich oft darüber, dass das Fasten seiner Gesundheit schade. Auch ihr könnt ruhig nicht auf eure Gesundheit achten, Meister Reinhardt. Einhard's statements are the only contemporary descriptions of Charlemagne's appearance. The only other information about the real stature of the Frankish king comes from his mortal remains in his shrine in Aachen Cathedral. The shrine was opened in 1988 for research and restoration purposes. Joachim Schleifring was the anthropologist charged with making an assessment. At the time, the conclusions were merely drawn from the bone's appearance. The strong bone structure and a large diameter of the pelvis were striking. Two long bones suggested a height of more than 1 meter 80. Various ossifications indicated an age at death of 60 to 70 years. It surprised me, given what we know about Charlemagne's age, that his skeleton was in a condition that I describe as top fit for his advanced age. He had very few degenerative changes in his knee joint and heel bone. There were no indications of breaks or injuries. His skeleton was in surprisingly good shape for his age. He was an athletic man of above average height. His bones were quite robust. The emperor's cranium is also in Aachen's cathedral treasury and can be examined. The sutures confirm Charlemagne's ripe old age of 66. That means he exceeded the average life expectancy of a Frank in the early Middle Ages by 37 years. By performing a medical analysis on his shin bone in the treasury, the scientists have completed the initial findings about Charlemagne's size and health. The chemist Bernhard Blumisch and the medical expert Frank Röhrli performed bone density measurements and magnetic resonance imaging. The examinations of Charlemagne's shin bones yielded various results and that allows us to get a better picture of him. We can reconstruct his height and we believe he was around 1 meter 84, which is tall for that time, but not abnormally tall. He was slender, not very robust. 
Er ist eher schlank, also er ist nicht sehr robust. Also er ist eher He also had a very well preserved interior bone structure. Also wir sehen mit dem Computertomographen sehen wir. The computer tomography reveals a relatively healthy bone without major pathologies. Pathologien in diesem Knochenstück. 1200 years after his death, modern medicine has confirmed that Charlemagne was in rude health. Just a few months after Hildegard's death, Charlemagne married an East Frankish noblewoman named Fastrada. She was described as clever and self-confident and made quite a few enemies in the male-dominated society. At the same time, in Saxony, there was fighting yet again. Sieht es mir nach, dass ich euch mitten in der Nacht rufen ließ, Meister Alcuin. Mein König? Ich quäl in Fragen. Ist diese Welt denn eine gerechte? Erfüllt sich in ihr ein göttlicher Plan? Und der Tod sagte, gibt es nicht jenseits des herrlichen Seins das trübe Nichts? Das Nichts Wert der König braucht euch nicht zu kümmern. Alles ist von Seinem erfüllt, wohlgeordnet, immerwährend und durch nichts zum Stillstand zu bringen. Dem Herrschenden kommt es zu, gemäß dieser göttlichen Ordnung zu handeln und das Reich gemäß der kosmischen Gesetze zu lenken. Nirgendwo ist nichts und nichts geht je verloren. Und nicht immer ist Gewalt der richtige Weg, Gottes Ratschlüsse für die Ewigkeiten durchzusetzen. Charlemagne was firmly expecting the last judgment, and like most of his contemporaries, he was probably scared of it. He knew that every person would stand alone in front of his judge, and he knew that a king would also be punished for the sins of his subjects. That's scary. I think Charlemagne will have been scared about death. And that a lot of the energy to reform his realm came from this fear. In 785, Charlemagne had a meeting with his greatest opponent, the Saxon leader Widukind. It was the first time the two had come face to face. Medieval society was a society where everything was focused on competition. The aim was always to subordinate the competitor. If he surrenders voluntarily shortly before defeat, he is entitled to be spared. Mein König. Erhebt euch, Herzog Widukind. Gelobst du in Gott, allmächtigen Vater, 
Widukind had himself baptized, and Charlemagne was his godfather. Charlemagne's acting as godfather to Widukind was an act of friendship, of friendliness and recognition. It's paying tribute to the defeated, if you will. The long-term story was a successful one. The Saxons who, who had never been very different from the Franks, except in terms of religion and not having kings. That was important. But their material culture was very similar to that of the Franks. Um, they understood each other, literally understood each other. So but they, they integrated. And, and Einhardt says that the Franks and the Saxons became one people. Widukind's price for peace was high, and despite the empty state coffers, Widukind's conversion to Christianity was worth several precious items to Charlemagne. The Museum of Decorative Arts in Berlin has one of them, the Bursa. It's said to be one of the baptismal gifts given to the Saxon prince by Charlemagne. Charlemagne waged the war against the Saxons under the motto, Baptism or Death, and Widukind chose baptism. That means he forswore all further resistance and subordinated himself to Charlemagne. That he got something from Charlemagne in return is also true. In some sense, he was a victor because he got his Saxon estates back and was able to return home after he'd spent a long time away. Charlemagne and Widukind forged a peace treaty with which the Saxon nobility grew more influential in the Frankish realm. The leader of the rebels was later glorified as a mythical being. As an advocate of Christianity, Widukind is said to have founded Anger Abbey in Westphalia. It's believed that this is also where he found his final resting place. The chiseled tombstone depicts him in the regalia of a priest king. The Saxon wars exhausted the Frankish realm. There were frequent rebellions that Charlemagne put down brutally. It took a long time to realize that it would take more than tough action and oppression to obtain the loyalty of his new subjects. The Frankish Empire achieved hitherto unknown dimensions during Charlemagne's reign it became the superpower in Europe. Even the powerful Duchy of Bavaria was annexed, along with parts of the Avar Kingdom in the east. Furthermore, most of the bordering regions were politically dependent on the Franks. These days we see Charlemagne as the father of Europe, or one of the fathers of Europe. But politically, you can't transfer the term Europe to the time of the Carolingians. Even though poets sang hymns of praise about Charlemagne at the time and called him the beacon of Europe, this was always a purely geographical term. Charlemagne got his name because he ruled over the largest part of the Christian West. In order to rule over his huge realm, Charlemagne was always on the go with his entourage. Unlike Hildegard, Queen Fastrada usually remained at court to support Charlemagne from there. The 
two were in constant contact via the Royal Military Postal Service. Ordner bei Hofer, eine Litanei mit Fastmann. Seit meiner Abreise von Regensburg habe ich keine Nachricht mehr von dir erhalten. Ich sorge mich daher sehr um deine Gesundheit. Möge es dir gut gehen. Ich grüße dich sehr im Namen des Herrn. Schatzmeister Nikolaus. During Charlemagne's absence, Vastrada was in charge of business. It's a responsibility Charlemagne wouldn't have given his previous wives. Warum sind die Leute aus Reims noch nicht da? Wo bleiben die Steinmetze? Vastrada is the only wife of whom a letter from Charlemagne to her survives. And again, it's a letter that's couched in. Um, in terms which are affectionate, but which also imply how politically important she was. Charlemagne's third wife, Fastrada, who presumably wasn't as young as Hildegard when she married Charlemagne, seems to have been more important to him politically. He included her more than he did Hildegard. We know that she's mentioned in the Capitulare de Villis, and she was to be kept informed about the proceeds of the royal estates, just like the king. Einhardt, who evidently didn't like her, blames her for the rebellion of Charlemagne's eldest son, Pepin the Hunchback. Der König stimmte oft den rücksichtslosen Handlungen seiner Gemahlin Fastra dabei und schien von seiner sonstigen Güte und Milde in ungewohnter Weise abzuweichen. Diese Königin, der Karl so freie Hand ließ, habe ich nicht mehr erlebt. Sie verstarb noch, bevor ich zu Aachen an den Hof kam. Damals war ich so alt wie du jetzt, Johannes. The palace in Aachen had become the main royal residence when the young Einhardt came to court. Charlemagne surrounded himself with European scholars in Aachen. Einhard was the only Frank among them. Charlemagne took advantage of different political opportunities to attract scholars from other countries to his court or to impose on them a stay at his court. I'm thinking of Paul the Deacon. But he also had a definite policy of attracting scholars. There's Alcuin, for example, who became one of the most outstanding scholars of the Frankish world. Willkommen im Reich der Gelehrten. Ich bin Osulf. Du musst Einhard sein? Ja. Einhard vom Kloster Fulda. Abt Baugulf hat mich geschickt. Ich habe gehört, du warst ein Musterschüler. Da. Das ist der große Alkuin von York. Von nun an dein neuer Lehrmeister. Da. Der weißhaarige alte Fuchs, das ist der Langobarde Paulus Diakonus. Angelbert, der Galan der Königstochter. Da, der dichtende Westgote Theodulf und Adalhard von Corby. Charlemagne wanted to use the scholars to advance the culturally backward Frankish Empire by implementing an educational reform. 
Even before Charlemagne, important people realized that the formal education, mastery of the Latin language, the ability to read and write Latin texts had suffered greatly in the Frankish realm. The Anglo-Saxon missionaries in the mid-8th century were the first to realize this. The first efforts to remedy the situation occurred under his father, Pepin. But Charlemagne really focused on it, and I think it's one of his most significant achievements that he felt he could fix this decline in education. Not by relying on the Franks alone, but by getting the support of educated foreigners. Diese Abschrift in Kirchenlatein wird an einen bayerischen Priester gehen. Bonifatius hat berichtet, dass der aus Unkenntnis in nomine patria et filia et spiritus sancti getauft hat. Im Namen Vaterland und Tochter und des Heiligen Geistes. Amen. <lacht> König Karl war außer sich. Und die bayerischen Priester sind nicht die einzigen, die des Lateinischen nicht mächtig sind. In the early days of Charlemagne's reign, the various scripts within the Frankish kingdom were quite different. That's why Charlemagne, who wanted to send out his decrees in writing all over the realm, was interested in having a uniform, simple, easily legible alphabet. And this was then implemented. One of the most important achievements of the educational reform came from Charlemagne's highest court scholar. The Alcuin Bible, written in Carolingian minuscule, the new script of small letters. This made a joined up, simple way of writing possible for the first time. It's the precursor of our current writing. The oldest surviving book in the German language also mentions Charlemagne's campaign for better education in the Frankish kingdom. The Codex Abrogans was a first dictionary of terms used in church Latin. Priests and lay people were to really understand what Christian texts talked about. One of the greatest achievements we can attribute to Charlemagne and his court scholars, because you always have to see him together with his entourage, is his educational reform, which is also known as the Carolingian Renaissance. It expresses Charlemagne's desire to improve knowledge of writing and the Latin language. And so the Carolingian Renaissance was a firm part of Charlemagne's government program and his social reform. In September 796, Charlemagne's son, Pepin, returned victorious from his campaign against the Avars in what is now Hungary. Father. Endlich, mein Sohn. Wie ich sehe, haben sich die Awaren in deinem Antlitz verewigt. Das war die Sache schon wert. Warte, ich habe dir etwas zu zeigen. Charlemagne gave his son Pepin the supreme command in the Ava campaign. That was definitely a test, and Pepin passed this test with flying colors. The victory against the Avars was a huge success. The booty was plentiful, and it greatly increased Charlemagne's standing. Es gibt sieben Wagen voller Gold. 
Und das ist nur der Teil, der dir gebührt. Auch unsere Fürsten sind reich beladen heimgekehrt. The Avar treasure gave Charlemagne the means to implement his visions. He founded bishoprics all over his empire and made them centers of his educational reform. He also planned the construction of a magnificent residence in Aachen. Die christliche Religion, mit der Karl seit seiner Kindheit vertraut war, hielt er gewissenhaft und fromm in höchsten Ehren. Deshalb erbaute er die wunderschöne Kirche in Aachen, die er mit Gold und Silber, mit Leuchtern und mit Gittern und Türen aus massivem Metall ausschmückte. Das war eine wunderbare Zeit damals. Das solltest du eigentlich alles mitschreiben, Johannes. Hm? Für diesen Bau ließ der König Marmor und Säulen aus Rom und Ravenna bringen, wie er sie sonst nirgends bekommen konnte. Ich glaube, es war seine Absicht, damals schon wie ein römischer Kaiser zu leben. Ja, das brauchst du jetzt aber nicht aufzuschreiben. Der Papst selbst hatte ja das wertvolle Baumaterial bewilligt. Der Mutter Gottes und unserem König zur großen Freude. The palace was by far the most elaborate building of the Carolingian era. A royal hall as the seat of government, a garrison and courtrooms, and the still extant octagon, a magnificent palace chapel based on the Roman Byzantine model. Even 200 years after its construction, the church dome was to be the highest north of the Alps. The symbolism of the central building speaks for itself. An octagon as a representation of heavenly Jerusalem. That was how Charlemagne expressed his entitlement to rule the whole world. Placing the throne on the gallery put the king in the most elevated position, into a special sphere. By the 15th century, it had been the coronation throne of 31 German rulers. The palace chapel, the octagon, which still exists as Aachen Cathedral, was influenced by a model in Ravenna. That's evident, but it's not at all clear how much he copied Roman buildings in general. There are certain documents, but they're by no means clear. During the reign of Charlemagne, Aachen fulfilled a part of what Rome once meant to the Roman emperors. But Aachen wasn't some kind of replica of Rome in Charlemagne's day. The stormy days of Charlemagne's youth were behind him. Now he focused more on seeking insights and gathered the leading scholars of Europe in Aachen to create philosophical circles. The participants called themselves after ancient and biblical role models. Flaccus, der getreue Priester der ewigen Glückseligkeit in Christus, entbietet dem geliebtesten Herrn König David seinen Gruß. Wird ebenfalls gegrüßt, großer Alkohin. Ah, da sind ja auch Homer und Nadulus. Alkohin, was sagt ihr heute über die Stellung der weltlichen und geistlichen Herrschaft? Drei Ämter gelten heute auf der ganzen Welt am höchsten. Das eine ist die Würde des Papstes in Rom. Das andere ist die kaiserliche Würde von Byzanz. Und das dritte ist die königliche Würde, in die euch, mein König, Gottes Wille als Leiter des Christentums eingesetzt hat. 
schon heute ist eure Macht hervorragender als die aller anderen. Für wahr. Und ich weiß zu schätzen, dass eure Worte nicht die eines höfischen Schmeichlers sind. Und ist es Gottes Wille, lieber Alduin, so werde ich den Weg zum höchsten Amt weltlicher Macht mit eurer Hilfe gern beschreiten. Charlemagne's plans have to have come together a while before the year 800. The first signs of them can be found in the royal annals, if you just look at who Charlemagne was communicating with at the time. Suddenly, from 797, all the great rulers are suddenly gathered around. Not just the emperor in Byzantium, the caliph in Baghdad, the emir in Cordoba, but also the lesser rulers, even from North Africa and Italy. Suddenly, everyone's represented. Within the next five years, they're all listed in the royal annals. That's a ruler acting like a world ruler. In April 799, an incident occurred in Rome that Charlemagne used to his political advantage. The Pope was physically attacked. Men from his closest circle were involved. They accused Leo III of fornication, adultery and perjury. In addition, he wasn't from Roman aristocratic circles. They abducted the Pope and wanted to make him unfit to hold office by blinding and mutilating him. But things didn't turn out that way. A loyal servant helped the Pope escape to the care of royal Frankish messengers, who led him across the Alps to the only conceivable place of refuge, to Charlemagne, the patron of the Roman Church. The trip across the Alps took eight weeks. Then the Pope, accompanied by Charlemagne's messengers, reached the royal palace in Paderborn. The meeting took place in Paderborn, far in the north, and Charlemagne definitely didn't hold it there at random. He wanted to demonstrate to the Pope what he had done for Christianity, for the spread of Christianity. That's why the meeting took place in newly conquered Saxony. When Leo III arrived, Charlemagne let him feel his power. Hoheit, ihr beliebt zu scherzen. Es käme mir niemals in den Sinn, in eurer Gegenwart zu scherzen, allerheiligster Vater. Noch dazu in solch brisanter Sache. Ihr rettet mich aus den Fängen dieser Bastarde, nur um dann über mich zu richten? Hoheit, ihr seid der von Gott befohlene Schutzpatron der Kirche. Ihr könnt mich doch nicht diesen diesen Verbrechern wieder ausliefern. Mir steht wahrlich nicht der Sinn danach, euch auszuliefern. Ich strebe einzig und allein nach Wahrheit und Gerechtigkeit. Und der kann nur in Rom Genüge getan werden. Bitte, erhebt euch, allerheiligster Vater. Sollten die Vorwürfe, die jene Verbrecher, wie ihr sie nennt, gegen euch erhoben haben, haltlos sein, so werde ich alles tun, um euch in Rom wieder einzusetzen. Die Vorwürfe gegen mich sind haltlos. Dann, heiligster Vater, habt ihr auch nichts zu befürchten. There are historians who suspect that this whole story was staged by Charlemagne so that he could present himself as emperor in Rome. I personally don't believe that. Charlemagne had had far too many successes already. The most recent success against the Avars in 795 made him the indisputable ruler of the West. 
He controlled all the old imperial residences in the West, including Rome. And I can't believe that such a man didn't have the idea all on his own, I want to be emperor. Nobody in Rome suspected what Charlemagne really wanted to achieve as supreme judge, namely to acquit the Pope in a proper trial. To do that, he cleverly used a legal dodge. And wie es sich gehört, werden wir uns in diesem Fall dem alten Grundsatz beugen, der da lautet, Papa Anemine Judicatur. Über den Papst darf nicht gerichtet werden. Schweigt! Über das Schicksal von euch aufrühren, befinde ich später. Heiliger Vater, seid ihr bereit, vor Gott, der Heiligen Schrift und eurem Gewissen einen Eid abzulegen, der bezeugt, dass jene Vorwürfe des Meineids und des Ehebruchs, die euch vorgeworfen werden, nichts als Lüge sind. Bei allem, was mir heilig ist, ich bin unschuldig. Und hiermit reinige ich Leo, Bischof der heiligen römischen Kirche, von niemanden verurteilt oder gezwungen, mich vor eurem Angesicht und schwöre vor Gott, dass ich die verbrecherischen Dinge, die jene mir vorwerfen, weder selbst vollbrachte, noch durch andere vollbringen ließ. Leo III, reinstated as the Pope, was to show his gratitude to Charlemagne the next day. Nun, König Karls letzte Reise nach Rom hatte mehrere Gründe gehabt. Die Römer hatten Papst Leo schwer misshandelt und er hatte den König um Schutz gebeten. Daher begab sich Karl nach Rom um die verworrenen Zustände der Kirche zu ordnen. Und um sich dann zum Kaiser krönen zu lassen? Ja. Bei dieser Gelegenheit erhielt er den Kaiser- und Augustus-Titel, der ihm anfangs so zuwider war, dass er erklärte, er würde die Kirche selbst an jenem hohen Feiertage nicht freiwillig betreten haben, wenn er die Absicht des Papstes geahnt hätte. Einhacht Einhardt reported on Charlemagne's coronation as emperor in a very strange way. He doesn't say when it happened. He doesn't say where it happened. He just said that Charlemagne had said later that if he had known of the Pope's intentions, he wouldn't have gone to church that day, even though it was an important holiday. He probably didn't entirely like the pivotal role of the Pope, because the Franks generally felt far superior to the Romans. The interpretation that emerged for Charlemagne's court was that he only got the imperial title, the Nomen Imperatoris, for something he had already achieved under his own steam. That's probably the context of that story. On Christmas Day 800, Charlemagne became Augustus Imperator Romanum, the noble emperor of the Romans. This act was to change the history of the world. From this point on, the Pope would crown emperors for centuries. The events of Christmas Day had far-reaching consequences. That's when the medieval empire was founded, which was to continue in the form of the Holy Roman Empire up until the year 1806. At the same time, this empire was closely tied to the papacy, even though Charlemagne mightn't have intended this. Charlemagne 
Charlemagne never returned to Rome. He started focusing on domestic politics. To secure the future of his huge empire, he implemented reforms. He put uniform laws in place. The silver denarius was introduced as the empire-wide currency. The cultivation of grains and fruits was to be improved. Charlemagne issued economic regulations that he put into effect on all his royal estates. As part of his comprehensive educational program, Charlemagne made schools accessible to lay people. His maxim was, first comes knowledge, then action. Charlemagne considered it his duty to guide his people to salvation. He had a Catholic and also a completely pragmatic understanding of his rule. His capitularies addressed moral aspects, since it was his God-given responsibility to make sure his entire people achieved blessedness. There's no doubt about it in the Admonitio Generalis. It was his job to lead his people to salvation. Karl musste in seinem Leben viele Schicksalsschläge hinnehmen. Vier seiner Söhne und eine seiner geliebten Töchter starben. Und er hat viel Tränen um sie vergossen. Denn seine Vaterliebe war für alle seine Kinder sehr groß. Unser Kaiser Ludwig war sein letzter verbliebener Sohn, der für die Thronfolge in Frage kam. Er hat ihn schon zu Lebzeiten zum Mitkaiser gemacht. Und diesmal verlief die Krönung nach seinem Plan. Kein Papst und kein Bischof. Er selbst hat als Demonstration seiner Allmacht seinem Sohn die Krone aufs Haupt gesetzt. Bald darauf kam es zu den seltsamsten Vorzeichen. Ein gewaltiger Blitz hat damals in das Dach unserer Kirche eingeschlagen die goldene Kugel auf der Spitze zerschmettert. Hinzu kam, dass der Palast in Aachen häufig erschüttert wurde und die Dächer der Gebäude, in denen Karl sich aufhielt, beständig knackten. Mehrere Monate bevor er starb, bemerkten einige Leute an der Wandinschrift im Dom, dass das Wort Prinzeps so verblichen war, dass man es nicht mehr lesen konnte. Und was tat der Kaiser daraufhin? Karl hielt nichts von diesen Vorzeichen. Hm. Jedenfalls tat er so, als gingen sie ihn nichts an. Charlemagne died of pneumonia when he was 66. After a reign of 46 years, he left his son Louis a huge empire. As Emperor Louis the Pious, he would continue his father's reform policies, but he wouldn't be able to maintain the unity of the Frankish Empire. Just 30 years later, the empire fell into three parts. West Francia, East Francia, from which a German empire emerged, and Middle Francia, which would later split further. But what's great about Charles? There have always been conquerors, but it has to be said that despite the empire's domestic difficulties after Charlemagne's death, 
especially during the reign of his son, Louis the Pious, during which there was inner conflict, the empire stuck together. He understood how to organize his empire so that it stood as a whole. A certain feeling of unity, of us, developed. The Saxons felt part of this us, as did the Lombards. Ich selbst halte seine Bedeutung für die Erneuerung der geistigen Kultur. I personally consider the renewal of intellectual culture as outstanding. He called it reparare, to renew, to repair, to restore. He restored the intellectual culture, Latin, the sciences, to understand faith properly, and this restoration of science continued to have an effect. It was a restoration of logic, of reason, of rational thinking, and that was incorporated into European society for the next 300 years, until it was so deep-seated that it changed the world. Charlemagne was buried in Aachen. Some say he was cruel and power-hungry, others praise him as being wise and agreeable to God. One thing that's certain is that as the first emperor of the medieval West, Charlemagne shaped an entire era. He ruthlessly forged an enormous empire with his sword, but he also made it flourish culturally. Even his contemporaries stylized him as a figure of light, while one created a literary monument for him. Irgendjemand hat diese Geschichte einmal erzählen müssen. 